Inside this room, all of my dreams become realities, and some of my realities become dreams. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? Alive, alive, it's alive, it's alive! You are listening to The Wilder Ride, getting wilder by the minute. Here are your hosts, Alan Sanders and Walt Murray. And welcome back, everybody, to The Wilder Ride, where we are getting wilder by the minute, a podcast where we are breaking down and celebrating young Frankenstein one really scared and begging for release minute at a time. I'm Alan Sanders. And I'm Walt Murray. And joining us once again to cap out and round out the entire week, we have Jody Stancil, pastor over at Riverside Community Church. Welcome. Thanks for having me back. Love that you're hanging around here. Again, you've kind of you've, you've brought a level of um, holiness to a place that normally was just full of holes. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad I can uh, contribute. <laughs> See, you are good for something. <laughs> yeah. <it's... laughs> no matter what the internet says no after, no. after this week. <laughs> yeah, you know he is a PI. He can dig up anything on anybody. Uh, I just gave up. <laughs> <laughs> I said, here, here's my yeah, I did too. I was like, yeah, you're not as interesting as you think. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not. Not at all. <laughs> you once you become a dad, yeah, it's all, all off the table at that that's point. That's it. I'm just done. Yeah. <laughs> Adventures are over. <laughs> and the record keeping in the 80s was spotty at best. Well, thank God I didn't have a camera phone oh. when I was a teenager. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I am so grateful for that every single day. You know, here's something I, I got to ask because before we get into this minute, uh, and I've, I've loved actually having your perspective in here as a pastor of a church. You, you obviously have a different perspective uh, of a lot of things, especially about life and about how we treat one another. We did not grow up with the internet or social media or instantaneous gratification, all about me, the me, me, me culture, which is what the millennial actually is coming from, not the turn of the 2000s, but actually the me generation, and they just called it millennial. How do you, as a pastor, find those challenges of today with such instantaneous all about me when really the life of the church is all about what I can do for you? Yeah, that is a fantastic question. I I think that's one of the biggest challenges that the church today faces. And and one of the things that I've noticed in the culture in particular is that there's been a higher rate, at least, of reported, you know, depression, mental illness, suicide, things like that. And I think it results from this sort of uh, inward focus. Uh, I believe it was Martin Luther who said that uh, man's problem is is that we are in curvetus say. Uh, now, I'm not very good at Latin, but that is we're uh, you know, the problem is sin is man turned in on himself. So if that's true and our problems come from our self-focus and our, you know, self-centeredness, self-righteousness, uh, uh, really, then you can see all these other things coming out from that. And so the more our, uh, you know, uh, next generation focuses on itself, the more you see a gap between it and God, but also you see distance between us and one another. Funny, you talk about how the self-righteous, inward-looking, I'm the most important person in the room, sort of a nice bridge into our talk with the good Dr. Frankenstein, who thinks it is all about him and all about his name, his reputation, his creation, his work, that he wants to make the most important thing in his life. Mm Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And we see how it almost destroys him here Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then maybe in other parts of the movie as well. But uh, obviously, we'll keep our focus here for now. Yeah. It's uh, I just love the parallels. And again, it all goes back to the original Mary Shelley Frankenstein, who was worried about man and technology outpacing what's important with caring for one another. The idea that there is something bigger and greater than ourselves out there. And when we lose focus of that and think that we're the biggest, most important thing in our own lives that we can suddenly become the monster that is actually the doctor. It's not his creature that's technically the monster. It's the one who made the monster. Yeah, and in the book, that that is his undoing uh, at the end. It's uh, it's his own madness, his own drive uh, that actually is the end of him in the book. It's a great allegory about how we should be treating one another. And funny how here we are, not only in the monster movies of the 30s, but now we're re- analyzing the comedic version of this Frankenstein story. But it's still, at its heart, the same story of when you think you are greater than God himself. Exactly, exactly. And that is the original sin, uh, the chief sin from which all the other sins that we commit, but all, actually all the other problems that we as a human race have, they come from that. Wow, this got heavy all of a sudden. I need a drink. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, can we have communion? <laughs> 
I always like the Catholic Church because I always like the, the the role of the priest is if the the because the wine being consecrated and the whole idea of transubstantiation, you can't let it go down the drain at that point. It must be consumed. And I'm like, that priest is just tanking the rest of the wine. That's right. awesome. <laughs> he really what a nice job this week. <laughs> it's like, hey, the Manischewitz is a little strong there, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Manischewitz, wow. <laughs> well, a lot of times you got to put like the really sweet, easy to drink wine for the for the congregants. I guess so. You know, then you've got the you got some churches that they do the grape juice to not offend anybody. You've got some that only do communion now and then. I grew up where we every mass. If you went to early mass, midday mass, late mass, you had communion three times. It was always part of the mass. So that's just how I grew up. Yeah, I had a friend whose grandmother was from Philadelphia, and I guess she was a very devout Catholic, and she went to Mass every single morning. So, I mean, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. That was the first thing she did. And when she came here to visit, she was shocked that they weren't getting up at, you know, 5 a.m. to make it to Mass before they went to work. (laughs) Surprise! (laughs) Yeah, it takes like an hour and a half to get to work here. (laughs) Yeah, that's not going to happen. So, Uh, but yeah, I was, I was, that was kind of a surprise that somebody would be that devout, but I was like, yeah, maybe she just really likes wine. You know, growing up, we always had nicknames for our priests because we went to a bigger parish that would have obviously different priests. It wasn't like, I think in your case, you just, you're the only pastor at your church. You don't have the ability to say, I'm, I'm phoning it in this morning. <laughs> I need someone else to go out there and, you know, and, and carry the load. You got to do it no matter what. Yeah, that's uh, what you get when you're a church planner. You're the solo guy. And so uh, as of now, I'm the solo guy. I am Presbyterian though, which means uh, we have uh, other guys that, that sort of come alongside and help govern the church. That's one of the distinctives of uh, Presbyterianism. And so I'm looking forward to having a couple of those guys uh, in the future. I, I, I'm praying, hey, Lord, why don't you send a few of those guys in now so I can do some of this what Alan's talking about. <laughs> you know what? We will make sure that at the end of today's show, we will ask, because if it's if it's for, for our local listeners, there's people all over the world pulling the podcast in, but maybe somebody's looking for a church home. We'll give you a chance to put a plug in for your ministry there, what you're doing. Um, the reason I asked that is because we learned nicknames for some of our priests, and two of my favorites were, which one did we get today that's going to serve the Mass, Father Short Mass or Father Long Mass? <laughs> <laughs> those were my two, f- well, well, one was not my favorite, but those were my two favorite nicknames, because we'd be like, we'd walk in and realize, oh, dear, it's Father Long Mass, we're going to be here for a while. <laughs> But Father Short Mass, he's like, forget the singing, forget it. We're, we're getting here, we're getting out, we're getting done. We got things to do. And I was like, I like this guy. Hour long mass, we get it done in forty. That's awesome. Well, I can go back home and play. And to your previous point, now you look around during the long winded guy, and everybody's on their phone. And oh, you, that's uh, got to be tough. Yeah, oh, you already lost. You didn't have that when we were growing I up. I get losing your audience in a theater because you might yeah. suck. You know, as an actor. But you would think at least in the house of the Lord, everyone would feel sort of that moral obligation to feign interest in the sermon. (laughs) What what does it look like for you when you reach? First of all, are there the Homer Simpsons out there that are trying to figure out how to either listen to a ball game or sleep? (laughs) Wait, am I going to put you on the spot? You can name names if you need to. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. That's what I was trying to figure out. It's like, how much do you tell here? Uh, (laughs) One thing I will tell you is that the, the pastor or preacher sees everything. Yeah. <laughs> so you learn how to focus really quick uh, because, you know, I mean, if the kid starts crying, the parents picks them up, takes them out, you see it. The guy's picking his nose, you see it. You know, so-and-so drops something in the floor, you see it. And so it becomes a uh, really a craft of, of being disciplined to put those things aside and to, to really focus. And then sometimes uh, one, one thing that's interesting is you can talk, but you're, you're also thinking in your head going, Lord, help me here because, uh, you know... <laughs> I'm, you know, or, give me strength. Yeah, look away, look away, because I'm about to start laughing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's happened a couple times. Yeah. yeah, I can imagine. Well, I will tell you the one thing I do, and I know we've kind of strayed for a second, but we'll get to this minute. But because we have our guests, and I always like to try to make sure that, unlike the me generation, I do like to make it about our guests, and I like to learn a little bit more about what they do and some of the some of the things that that, that connect us and some of the things that make us each unique. And when it comes to preparing for a sermon. When I grew up, I grew up in such a formal high mass in the Catholic church that the actual homily was usually just a small piece. It was only like usually five or six minutes. When I got older and went to other churches, I did enjoy the fact that if a if a preacher or a pastor of a church had something he really wanted to say, that that would sometimes last 15, 20 minutes, that the other stuff might be shortened to make room for a much more dedicated message. And I learned to appreciate that as an adult where I never appreciated that as a kid. 
Yeah, and that's one thing that I would say is particular to uh, my denomination and uh, our church is that we really focus on the preaching of the Word, the, the means of grace. We, we say that's the primary means of grace because the Bible talks about faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So that's where our primary emphasis is on, is on the reading and proclamation of God's Word. And really what I see my job is doing is kind of like what you're doing here, uh, because what you're doing with this movie is you're exegeting this movie. You're taking a little scene at a time and you are just seeing, letting, you know, what you see there come out of that. And so that's what I think my job is with a, a, a biblical text is to exegete that passage to see what's there and to pull it out and to, to make it applicable to where the people are today and to show you, hey, here's how this applies today into your life. First of all, here's what God says. But then secondly, here's how it applies to your life. So that's one thing I've appreciated about uh, the way you approach this uh, uh, podcast is you're exegeting an awesome movie. And so I can relate to that because I exegete an awesome some book. Look, at it. I, I love it because if I say it with the right tone, it could sound like I was really naughty. <laughs> <laughs> hey, baby, you want to exegete? <laughs> want to exegete? Because I can get a whole lot out of you if you let me. Well, there's also eisegeting, reading things in, right, and so exactly. I think you're doing that yeah, now. I'll we crossed the line here. <laughs> we crossed the line because I do. I like the whole idea of uh, diving in there and getting, well, them, getting it, as much it, out of it as I can. What you may find is uh, she may sleep through your sermon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, oh, my God. He's pontificating. <laughs> oh, Mr. Monologue going on and on and on. Loves the sound of his own voice, doesn't he? <laughs> And of course, I've just driven it off the rails. <laughs> you could just, I could often see other people on the other line just putting the phone down, doing a load of laundry, you know, checking the dinner, coming back. Yeah, still talking. That should keep going. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not that bad, but I have known people who are like that, who are just, you get them going. It's like, oh, how do I interrupt them? <laughs> I got to go. Well, it's time I, to I, interrupt. Yeah, I've been this, around this. It's, it's time for us to interrupt the side trail here that we've went down because we've got to get back to minute number 75. And you talk about trying to exegete trying to get the most out of something. It looks like the doctor is trying to exit the room itself yes. <laughs> as we begin minute number 75. He wants to exegete everything out of that room and try to learn what he can outside the locked door, not inside the locked door. So we're going to start with the doctor saying, let me out, let me out, get me out of here. And we will end with, look at that boyish face. So let's dive into this. We are now face to face with Frankenstein's creature awake. And Dr. Frankenstein realizes he's chained. Sure, he's chained to uh, the, the bed over there. But he realizes uh, those chains suddenly up close don't seem nearly as strong as I once thought they might be. And he wants out of that room. And you can't blame him. I mean, you again, we get to see the monster in full glory. I mean, the way well, he Hopefully not full filled, glory. Well, not, hopefully not full. <laughs> but... When you have the scene right here at the beginning of the minute where Gene Wilder's face is nearly in the camera and the monster stands up behind him, you really do get a sense of the enormity of the creature here. He really fills up the whole rest of the screen. Yeah. And if, and what I like is what's happening here is, the, again, Peter Boyle being very cognizant of the lines being delivered. If you watch when it's the reverse angle where Gene Wilder's face is right up like as if the camera is right there at the door. If you watch in the background while he's yelling at them, you see the creature looks down and says, OK, I've got these chains. Now, these chains are in each hand. I could rip them up right now, but Gene's got lines he still has to <laughs> right. say. <laughs> So I'm going to kind of move these around a little bit and wait until all of a sudden it's the right time to yank these chains up out of their holster, out of the, I guess, the castings in the ground. Right. And then they must just fall off of him at that point because now he's on the loose. Yes, he is. And there's only one person in, standing in the way of his freedom. Right. The guy who the last <laughs> time he saw him, he said he has a rotten brain. Right. <laughs> Thanks, We're Dad. him in the streets. You got a rotten brain, Dad? <laughs> Thanks for coming back into yeah. my room. That'll, that'll leave a little bitterness, a little bad taste in your mouth as a kid. Now, the very first line he utters here, which is exactly like in the script, let me out, let me out, let me out of here. There are some changes in the script versus what he does here. Because after that first, let me out, let me out, get me the hell out of here, he adds the line, couldn't you tell I was joking? Don't you know how to take a joke? Ha, ha, ha. Totally ad-libbed. Was not in the script at really? all. Just added that little bit about, couldn't you tell I was joking? And then, 
when he does say the uh, takes the Lord's name in vain, we have a pastor mm-hmm. amidst us. We do not want to do anything that would get him in trouble with his parishioners. Well, it is his, kind of his ironic. followers, not the parishioners. I'm worried about. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the wife. <laughs> well, no, it's us in the room. I was yeah. thinking more. Well, yeah, I was thinking more of the Lord, but uh, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, not one whole, to be trifled with. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's, there's a commandment yeah. somewhere we're supposed to be paying attention to here. Uh, that's the third one. <laughs> He's the, give me the third. Like I don't. Thank you. Like a good Catholic, I use the Bible to prop up the short leg of the table. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's actually I, in the book. I don't recommend that. No, I can help you with that. I know somebody that can, can help well, you Well, now that. you could put it on your phone. We're yeah. in 2018. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain. You got it. So, yeah. But in this case, Gene Wilder, when push comes to shove and you realize you're about to be ripped limb from limb, sometimes you throw caution yes, to the wind. Do. I will risk eternal damnation in breaking the third commandment in favor of getting my ass. <laughs> out of that room. <laughs> yeah, and he's trying every trick. He is. I mean, and this is where that set up, the slow joke set up that I so love so many times in this film. It's not the instantaneous gratification. You have to, in your head, go back, and on rewatching, he's so adamant just a two minutes before, no matter what you hear, no matter what I say, no matter how loud I scream, do not let me out of this room because you will ruin my work. You will ruin all that I have done. And now he's trying to immediately take them, put the brakes on it. I I love this because uh, it's such a picture of our lives and especially with our idolatry. You know, we typically don't think we have idols and it's like, yeah, we do. And some of the worst things that we ever face in life are are of our own creation. You know, and he's so adamant (laughs) beforehand. It could be like a minute by minute podcast (laughs) that we decided to create that has slowly taken (laughs) over our lives. It's like, yeah. And so you're thinking like, you know, no matter what happens, you know, wife, don't call me and get me out of this podcast right you know and then once you're like into it you're like man i gotta get out of here <laughs> I got somewhere I alan's be. been saying that since day two <laughs> what, what the hell did i commit to minute three was like oh, the realization <laughs> i'm trapped with a monster <laughs> yeah that's right you <laughs> yeah. oh my so gosh. But yeah we do that we do that whether it's whether it's taking on too much at work mm-hmm. sometimes it's not knowing how to say no we overcommit ourselves sometimes we're married to our work instead of to our spouses. Sometimes we maybe get lost in, I don't know, alternative forms of dealing with life, whether that's drugs or alcohol. We sometimes, you know, we look for escape. And sometimes we can get so lost in the escape because the escape feels good as a short-term fix. And that's usually what the problem is. It feels so good the short-term. This is what gets me out of what I should be doing. Pretty soon, you no longer remember what it was you were supposed to be doing. Yeah, uh, who knew a Mel Brooks film could be a good coping mechanism? I, Seriously. you know, it, it, if that's what that is, I, I'm not saying I, I'm not saying that it is, but uh, it could be. There's my be. redeeming value. Go back to the wife tonight and say, so look, actually, what we did is we had a really good sermon in here about how Young Frankenstein is actually a metaphor for how we should not run our lives. I think both of our wives are going to appreciate these minutes. So. I'm well, just here to help, guys. And it, <laughs> <laughs> but it is interesting the way that he responds to it. He's bargaining. He's kind of lying. He's doing everything he can, throwing every trick in the book to get them to let him out. And you see that Inga responds, and she tries to... Because uh, she cares him. the most for yeah. him. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So she goes for the doorknob, and Frau Bluka... <laughs> because Frau Bluka does not care in that way. She She believes... With a doctor ordered, and she's going to follow the orders. Well, and, and she believes in the monster. Yeah, but I think she, in this case, she's still, she's being, well, first of all, this is what she wants. She wants him to try to help the monster. And so she's saying, yeah, he told us. That's right. Don't open this door. And of course, Igor is too clueless to, to have a thought on the matter one no, way yeah. or the other. But Inga does care. Inga is trying to come to his rescue and is not allowed to come to his rescue. Yeah, and you know, all through this, Igor has not really cared. Igor? Uh, I, gosh, I'm sorry. Igor. <laughs> Marty Feldman. <laughs> Trust the Igor fish. He, he's never really had an emotional buy-in to this. He, he's he been dutiful. Mm-hmm. He's done his job. And, and it's almost like he's been along just to kind of see what happens. But he's never really... I mean, even just in the last minute where he was like, oh, it's been nice working with you. You know, there's not really any emotional tie-in or, you know, there he's like, oh, well, I'll be on to my next thing if... If this doesn't work out, so. there'll be another crazy scientist that comes along. <laughs> right. And there's bound to be another Frankenstein. So. Now, there is a moment when 
Inga wants to go to the door, but she and Igor are looking at each other, and Igor at least is nodding his head like, mm, yeah, maybe, not, not maybe, well. uh, but I'm not going to say anything. You say something. Frau Bluka's over there. <laughs> right. But Frau Bluka grabs Inga and will not let her at all, will not let her get to the door. I mean, Frau Bluka, arms up against the, the, the frame of the door. You're not coming close to it. I'm guarding it with my life. Right. This is, we're letting this play out. A couple of things here that he does add, and one of the things is the third time that he actually uses the word mama. <laughs> he called for his mommy when he was having the nightmare. Mm -hmm. He called for his mommy when he thought the experiment failed and was ready to just end it all, and he's mm -hmm. calling for her again now. So there's those threes again. Triperspectivalism, man. I'm going <laughs> to learn that word someday. I don't know how to spell it, but I can say it. <laughs> I was going to say, if you could text that to me, that'd be awesome. <laughs> yeah, I'll text do that. <laughs> text that to you after the show. That's the Trilateral Commission, what now? Tri <laughs> <laughs> Let's see how good Siri is with that speech to text. <laughs> you know how sad this is with speech to text? There are times where I look at a word and I'm like, I don't think I spelled that right. So I dictate to freaking Siri to see if she'll spell it right for me. And if it's exactly like I spelled it, I feel better about myself. <laughs> Than, than trusting my own memory of how to spell words. Hey, I can't tell you how many times I've tried to, to say something or spell something on, on my phone, and I'm like, uh, what's another word for <laughs> whatever it was I was trying to spell? <laughs> <laughs> you, just, you just say, what's the dumber, easier word? Because I don't remember what I'm trying to actually spell. K-9. K-9. <laughs> C A N I N E is way too many letters. Oh, I was thinking dog. Yep. Oh, yeah. That's what I was thinking. Oh, dog. Yeah, that would be easier. Yeah, that would. But I, I've had stuff where I'm, I, I actually did this with you a couple of days ago. I was trying to voice text while I was going somewhere, and I was like, Siri has no idea what I'm trying to say. <laughs> so I had to stop and wait for the next red light. Yeah, well, part of that might be your what we call accent. We would affectionately call the redneck, <laughs> mountain, hillbilly, backwoods, trailer. You should really have that looked at, Walt. <laughs> yeah, really should. Yeah, need uh, some sort of... Uh, I don't know anything about that. What's so I, I know? No. See, the, the greatest thing about having us as hosts and co-hosts of this show is every time we introduce somebody who doesn't know us personally and they're only dialing in over the phone or, or via the computer, and I say, okay, that's Walt over there. He goes, oh, no, I got Walt's voice down. I know. Yeah, I, know. No, no. I totally <laughs> know who Walt is. Yeah, we know exactly who he is. <laughs> he's, 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 he's the voice of every man I've ever seen when the tornado hits. <laughs> And then that UFO came down and, <laughs> boy, howdy. Sounded like a train. <laughs> I was sitting out back and I was drinking from my jug and I heard it sound like a train coming through. And all my teeth screwed back. <laughs> and I yelled to my grand, I yelled to my wife. I said, my honey, get the kids, put them in the cellar. We got, we got ourselves a tornado coming. <laughs> and darn if I didn't hear the rattling and the screaming and the crying. And then all of a sudden I come up and the house is gone. <laughs> By the way, am I on TV? Hi, Mom. But it cured my rickets. <laughs> cured my rickets. <laughs> cured my rickets. <laughs> Why is it they always find like the, the worst dressed, <laughs> worst spoken person possible <laughs> to get a? You know what it is? I know exactly. I just thought of it. Every other self-respecting person who just lost their home is not going to be caught dead on camera. <laughs> yeah. It's the one idiot with the Marlboro sticking out of the corner of his mouth, the, the wife beater right. t-shirt with gravy stains on it, going, hey, I'll talk to the camera. I want to yeah. tell you exactly what happened. Well, if you're looking for ratings and you pull up and you've got your choice between Hillbilly Jim <laughs> and the English professor, which one are you going to interview? Oh, yeah. yeah the, the guy <laughs> comes up and goes... Well, I was talking to myself over dinner and thought that that's a rather loud sound coming our way. So we promptly exited the table, went down into the cellar where we continued to dine in private as the storm slowly took our home away. Yeah, and you're like, yeah, okay, like, Einstein, we're going to get the dude who's playing with the with the hound yeah. dog. Yeah, who put Shakespeare up on the dang camera? Heck, <laughs> you watching? How did suddenly you turn on a public broadcast? What is going on? I want to watch the news. Go interview Jethro and the Blue Tick Hound. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. All right. So getting back to our minute here, I want to talk about the lighting here for just a moment because it's going to shift as we move into next week. It's really ominous here. We get the sense of some kind of a palladium or sort of a curved window, barred window where the light is hitting. And as, you know, as the creature was laying there, it was sort of on one wall, not in the corner, but certainly against one wall. And it kind of kept his face in shadows until he popped up. And now he's standing up and he's fully lit. But 
that lighting, which is beautiful right here, you're going to see is completely shifting for Monday of next week. I know I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but I have to point it out now so it's the last thing we can remember. But that lighting, which is beautiful here, it gives us that sense of shadow and depth and it's it's sort of ominous. We realize, you know, he's not in a well-lit, safe place. This is sort of like the dungeon almost. Even though this is the library, it took me a minute to realize we're not in a jail cell. It looks like it's a it's a place where you would, you know, detain somebody, not the private library. Right. Well, and it, and it goes back to what we've talked about before, that they really cared and they took, I mean, they went to great measures to get this right. And the talent of the people who, who did this movie and, and put this together is just unbelievable. I want to get to a part here that I'm having a real hard time hearing. Because when he suddenly realizes that he's not going to be let loose. They're, they've they taken everything that he said just two minutes earlier, and they're actually sticking to it. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're listening to him. He mutters something under his breath. Now, Jody, you said you looked up a transcript. Somebody wrote what they thought it was, but I'm, I, I, I don't think it's correct. But what did you think, or what did you find that someone said it was that he mutters? The thing I found somebody said is, this is a summit, which doesn't really make sense. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I don't know why. Uh, maybe... I don't know. Maybe he does say that, but it doesn't really make sense. This is in a the context. So it's like another brother. No, this is a summit. <laughs> this is a summit. Well, let's okay. Let's 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 decide first. Well, what what, what else? What, what did you hear, Walt? Uh, you know, I I've probably now listened to this about ten times today, and the best I can come up with is, well, this is a <laughs> shit show. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I no, I'm, I'm I'm pretty sure that's wrong. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go on a limb, <laughs> but when I listen to it over and over, I don't hear the sh- t- show. Right, I no, don't I... hear the sh- t- uh, show. <laughs> trying to censor myself. We've got a man of the cloth in our studios. He doesn't appreciate that tone you're no, having. I, there, I Walt. got the look. <laughs> Actually, there's a word in uh, Philippians where the Apostle Paul is talking about his righteousness that he had when he was a Pharisee. That's before he came to know Christ. And the Greek word is scubula. And my professors in seminary said that probably the, because it is a vulgar word and it's in the vulgar language, that it probably the closest translation to that would be that word you just said. Well, there you go. I was just being biblical. You're <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Just say scubula next time. Scubula. You don't have to worry about it. That's a good. It was a scubula show. There scubula you go. Show. You know, I I can't figure out what was going on here, and I don't know if it was just something that he mumbled, thinking it was going to get cut out, or if it just. It, but whatever it but is, he does right sense. after he says that, he kind of goes uh, 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 like he doesn't know what he's yeah. going to say. Almost like words are getting caught in his throat. So I, that was a summit. Okay, let's go. Let's go down that trail just for a minute. If that's what he said, because I don't think that that's entirely right, because I can't wrap my vocabulary, the use of the human language, around why would you say that? Why would you say, that was a summit? Why would, I mean, because a summit is more like a political, like when you're having some kind of a big meeting between nations, we're having a summit. You know, about arms disposal or arms limitation talks. You know, we had the summit. We had the had a summit at Reykjavik. You know, Gorbachev and Reagan meeting for the first time for a summit. Or, you know, you have some kind of a, a, a big meeting. I guess you could read into that, that this meeting through the door, let me out, let me out, give me that. But it wasn't really a meeting. <laughs> it was more like a plea yeah. for his own life. Yeah, I, I'm really at a loss. And, and the best I can figure is he just said something, you know, he was mumbling something, thinking that. That's what I think he says. I think he says, that was something. Oh, that that could work. Like, yeah. I can't believe they actually listened to me. That was something. Yeah. Or, or I can't believe they didn't listen to me. Or is he saying something, Is it? Uh, and, and he doesn't necessarily say it right. He's like, think of something. I got to think of something. That was something. You got to yeah. think of something. Think. It's, it's, I think something is part of that. It's either that was something or think of something. So do you think it was something that was intentional or do you think it was unintentional? What if he said, what if he is saying, think of something? That would make sense. You know, i got to think of something to, oh, to yeah, fix that, this that and something to do because this thing's going to kill me if I don't. Yeah. And maybe he just didn't verbalize it clearly enough. Yeah. It's just hard to tell what he's saying because... Oh, that's yeah, funny. <laughs> I can hear where people would think that it says that was a summit because it sounds like a th- sound. But also, is he saying think of something? And does he like maybe because it gets caught in his mouth... It could that be. That you hear kind of what you think you want to hear and now you can't unhear it. 
But that was something would make more sense than anything else that yeah. I've heard or thought. That was something. So. Yeah, if it's a that, if he is saying that was, I think it's that was something. That was something. So I think it's if that, that or think that of something. So it's either, it, which both I think works better. It's either that was something like holy, what do you call the word? Granulia? Scubula. Scubula. Scuba, scuba yeah. diving. Holy scubula. They actually listen to me. Or hurry up, think of something. Whichever one he's, whichever words he's saying, there's something being muttered under his breath. I don't yeah. think it's it's not in the script. We heard a, tr- you know, somebody had a transcript. Um, I guess what we could do, which I didn't think to do, go watch the movie with subtitles on oh, and see if yeah, there's anything oh, there. Weird. But I have a I'm feeling what you're going to see is the word like in parentheses mutters under his breath yeah. <laughs> or <laughs> muttering, unintelligible, unintelligible, right? Yeah. But he does say something, and there's this Gene Wilder, the absolute master of the pause. Using yeah. the pause to perfect effect because right after he's choked on whatever he's saying, he's in a total freeze frame. And then the next thing out of his out of his mouth is, "Hello, handsome." <laughs> and again, which is awesome. We cut to Peter Boyle, who is ready to rip this man's arms off. And as soon as he points to him, he's like, "Who, who are you talking to?" He's like looking behind us. Right. Some, <laughs> somebody else in the room is because huh. uh, I thought it was just the two of us here. And now you're talking about "Hello, handsome," and I know it's not me because everybody's like scared of me. Yeah, and it's funny. I think we've talked about this before, but he is using kind of that fatherly flattery to win the uh, the kid over, so that he can really get to where he needs to be with him. But it's um, it, the interaction between kind of creator and creature. There is uh, is pretty cool because he does, you know, really figure out what it is that he's looking for and gives that to him in order to kind of get him on his side. Yeah. Um, you know, I remember some, uh, speaking of father, some uh, great words of wisdom that my father passed along to me. And, and that is, you know, when you can't dazzle them with intelligence, you <laughs> baffle them with uh, bull scuba. Let's just bull put it scubula. that way. So I'm, I'm thinking that's maybe what he's, he's doing right here as, as a father with his son. And... Wise words. <laughs> um, there are some changes here from the script as we are, Seeing him start to say, well, I got to figure out something. I think of something. If you got to think of something to say, he says the line, hello, handsome, not in the script. Then he says, you are a good looking fellow. Why do people laugh at you? Because they hate you. But why do they hate you? Because they are jealous. And so there's some extra lines in there that sort of just kind of get clipped here and there and sort of massaged, a couple of things added. But I think it's interesting that the whole mutter under his breath, whatever he's saying, and the very first thing he's like, Hello, handsome. And Peter Boyle completely taken off guard. And it goes back to the deleted scene we read two days ago, two minutes ago, that the brain wants to be loved and feel loved. And so flattery sometimes is mistaken for love. And at least it's a way of trying to get to more positive feelings rather than derogatory when you're trying to call them horrible or rotten. Well, and it's a good technique when you're trying to talk someone down, someone who's really emotionally over the top, to be able to compliment them, and it, it gets their attention in a different way. It, it redirects them and helps them to kind of get back down into reality so that you can have a normal conversation with them. And he masterfully does that right here. I mean, he hits mm-hmm. him with what the, the creature needs. Mm-hmm. That he needs to be accepted, he needs to be liked, he needs to be loved. And that's what he he hits him with. When he says, look at you, and he says, look at that boyish face, once again, another line that was Gene Wilder in the moment saying, trying to create a bond with the creature, not in the original script, but works very well to end this minute because he's gotten the creature's attention, and now he realizes, I have to keep going, I have to keep complimenting, and I have to keep building one compliment on top of the other, on top of the other, mm-hmm. which unfortunately for us, we don't get to see the rest of today because this scene is going to continue into next week. But uh, I want to start as we wrap this minute up, as we are wrapping up the end of the week. We had a lot of great side discussions. Jody, it's been fantastic having you here to to give your insights and, and to bring really some, some fantastic from a religious perspective and what makes us all supposed to strive for the betterment in ourselves rather than getting caught with worshiping false idols. Was there anything that we covered in this minute that you wanted to add or, or something we missed? You know, just in terms of uh, he, he resorts to flattery here. Um 
you know, the scripture, the, the Bible, uh, bids us to speak the truth in love. And so one thing I think that, uh, you know, obviously this is played for laughs and it is funny, which is the whole flattery thing because he is so out there, you know, but, but, you know, speaking the truth in love, he could have said, you know, hey, you're the first of your kind. You're the first creature that's ever been reanimated. That makes you one of a kind. You are unique. Uh, you have value. There's something about you. You know, maybe I would have gone with that approach. You, <laughs> you, you said earlier, hey, what would your approach would have been? That would have been my approach, yeah. <laughs> uh, at least I think, uh, rather than just start mumbling. And uh, I, but who knows, man? I'm 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 a biggest sinner, uh, you know, and so I I could have done that myself and resorted to flattery and there, but by the grace of God, go I. <laughs> well, what we'll have to wait and see. Uh, has he learned his lesson? It's you know, I told you, I don't know that he's entirely on board with the I'm going in there to save him with love and tell him how much he's loved. And I, I you know, he's obviously going to say whatever he has to to get himself safe right now. Sure. But I get this feeling that as he continues to win over the creature, we're going to wait and see just how much does he actually care about the creature or does he still have some issues with kind of being stuck on himself? Yeah, and we've kind of talked about how strong that God complex is. And it's not one that just dies. uh, It's quiet death. And we see that with him up to this point. So it'll be interesting to see where it goes from here. Well, you got any other uh, any other notes uh, I just uh, noticed that Gene Wilder's hair is continuing to be out of control, and I don't know that anybody else in the history of humanity has ever had hair like that. <laughs> that is the craziest hair I've ever seen, and uh, it, it just it's it's a character unto itself. It's, it is, but it's oh, it's Gene Wilder hair. It is, and I love I love the line of. Of I, of I will kick your rotten heads in. <laughs> I don't know why. Every time I hear that line, I start laughing. It just It's a great, funny line. It, funny that he uses the word rotten, because the last yeah. time he used it, he was talking directly to his, well, he was talking to Frau Bluka about the creature. It's like, it's a rotten brain. Yeah. yeah. Now he wants to kick these rotten heads in. <laughs> yeah, right. So. Did he really expect they were going to open the door after saying yeah, that, I think too? that would have been the key to yeah, get yeah. To Oh, it. yeah. The rotten, calling them, saying that their heads are rotten. Yeah. That'll get him to open the door. Yeah. Hey, he insult insulted them. me. Let's get yeah, out of yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> and that always works with my kids. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no kidding. Let's double lock the door. So. All right. Well, anything else that you got? No, that's it. All right. Well, this has been a great week here. We've had a lot going on. We started off earlier this week with uh, cigars going on and l- th- thumbs lit on fire and creature breaking through the door only to be captured. And now the ironic part is when the creature was captured, now he was alone in the cell. And now the Dr. Frankenstein seems to be captured alone in the cell. He's trying to get the one up on the creature. We're going to have to wait till next week on Monday. Come on back for Minute 76 for that. Before we tell you what's coming up next week... Jody Stancil, pastor of Riverside Community Church. I know we're a podcast that's going around the world. People listen all over the place, but we actually do have listeners right in our own backyard. If somebody is in the Northwest Georgia area and they're maybe looking to find a different church community or at least take one for a test drive, where uh, where can people learn a little bit more about your church? Yeah, the best place uh, would be our website, RiversideCartersville.com. That'll just tell you our basic stuff, why we're here and what we're doing and where we meet. You're always welcome to get in touch with me personally. I love to sit down and get to know people and, you know, talk about life and talk about struggles and uh, things like that. And most of all, I like to talk about Jesus. So if any of those things uh, interest you, you know, shoot me a message uh, through the website and let's grab lunch. Uh, and if somebody is maybe too far away, but they're just interested in maybe a line of communication, do you have an email address or anything that you check? Yeah. Uh, Jody at RiversideCartersville.com is a great way to get in touch with me. That's my email address at the church and uh, love to hear from you. Excellent. And uh, might have a good time going in if you're if you're close enough and sitting in on one of those sermons. Who knows? Maybe he'll actually work in uh, what he learned himself about young Frankenstein. You'll have to come this week and find out. Let's see what uh, the, the message is still percolating for Sunday morning. So uh, young Frankenstein would be a great illustration for my point. So. And I know at least one of your uh, congregates who it would resonate with. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Walt, uh, if people want to learn a little bit more about us. They want to maybe reach out and contact us. They, they, they We missed something. They want to let us know or, or or they loved our insight. Where can they go? Well, again, we would encourage you to uh, take a minute and go to facebook.com slash the wilder ride. Find us there. Join our listeners group and uh, get involved. And 
you know, we we cover this pretty well, but I'm finding people are really coming up with some great insight into some of the, the stuff that we miss. So really appreciate those uh, those folks joining in. Also, we'd like to encourage folks, if you uh, would take a minute to go to patreon.com slash the wilder ride, uh, take a minute just to look at the different offerings we have there, get involved in that community. We do have some expenses that are associated with doing this. And if you can give a dollar a month, that would be awesome to help offset some of, uh, some of our costs if you want to go more than that. And we have an executive or an a I I'm drawing a blank. What do we uh, call? Well, our we've got different doing? tiers, but one of the tiers is called the associate, associate producer, producer level. Thank you. Where if you would like to help support the show at ten dollars a month, that's one of the many tiers that we have, and each one earns some different things. And this one earns you the chance to be called out on the show from time to time as helping to produce the show as an associate producer. So thank you, Tara Bain, who is our current associate producer over at Patreon.com. Much like when we pass the plate around to help support the church, <laughs> we're passing the plate around to support two idiots in the wilder <laughs> ride. <laughs> so we would appreciate that absolutely. No truer words. <laughs> well, come on back Monday. We'd love to have you out there. Whether whether you put something in the plate or not, it's irrelevant. Much like any church, we are open to anybody and everybody, especially if you love Gene Wilder and love Young Frankenstein like we do and come back tomorrow. We will be diving into minute 76 where we have just started to compliment the creature. We will start with the line, "Look at that sweet smile," and then end with Without any shame, that... And we'll just have to end there because this scene is going to continue on into early next week. So you need to come on back here and be with us on this, The Wilder Ride. (laughs) I had something. (laughs) Give me out. Give me out. Give me the hell out of here. Would you stop or I'll kick your your rotten head in? (laughs) Which was the poop word? Scubula. 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 I feel like that's the sound effect they make in Scooby Doo when you're like gonna go. Oh yeah, Scooby Doo, Scooby Doo, Scooby Doo. I'm gonna go back in time and tell you what. What are really they happened. really saying? So here's what really happened. Scooby Doo, Scooby Doo, Scooby Doo.